Welcome to A Halting Toward Zion, the podcast where we limp like Jacob to the promised land and talk about life, the universe, and everything along the way. I'm Emily Maxson, here with Greg Ettinger and Brian Brew, and we're talking about the law. The psalmist wrote, oh, how I love your law. And uh, I think that's pretty much going to be, you know, the, the heart of our conversation today is the, the law of the Lord is, is good, and it is a blessing to have it. We don't get a new law with the coming of Messiah. We get the same law because God is the same uh, yesterday and today and forever. Is that, is that accurate? Of course, people are automatically <laughs> thinking uh, sacrifices, circumcision, um, kosher laws. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's not. We, would some, we need yeah. to make some distinctions, obviously. Because yeah. <laughs> otherwise this would be like five minute, you know, podcast. And what's the fun in that? Right. But as you said, <laughs> as the prophets looked forward and as the writer of Hebrews looks backward, they tell us that the new covenant is going to be, well, new. It's going to be better, better hope, better promises, better sacrifice, a better country, a better and more enduring substance, the writer of Hebrews says. But so in short, the there is still sacrifice. There just is. <laughs> There's just one for all. There's a priest. He's better than all the other priests put together. There are still promises, but they are better promises. But when the writer of Hebrews comes to discuss the place of God's moral law, he does not say that there's a new and better law. He says the law will be written in a better place. Paul says, assuming for the moment, <clears throat> hypothetically, that the writer of Hebrews and Paul are not the same person, <laughs> um, Paul tells us of uh, the writing of the new covenant in the fleshly tables of the heart. And that's what the writer of Hebrews says, quoting Jeremiah, that under the new covenant, God will write his law in the hearts of his people, which is to say he will transform human nature in terms of his standards so that we will no longer be left to our own, nor will his standards simply be something outside of us condemning us but they will become a new principle of life and thought for us. Now, we could just leave it at that and call it a day, but let's qualify a few things here. First of all, we do acknowledge, and the New Testament acknowledges very clearly, um, shadows, ceremonies, rites and rituals that were by their very nature temporary. The thing is that anybody who was thoughtful and actually listened knew they were temporary. Mm -hmm. From the time that Adam and Eve sacrificed the first lamb, they could stand there and say, wow, that's where we're, we're right with God for now, dear. Yeah, we have to do this again, don't we? And again and again. Hmm. Seems like a really bad sacrifice. Well, it's a picture. Yes, it's a picture. What do you think it's a... Well, we, we, we deserve to die like this lamb, but this lamb is dying for us. Mm -hmm. So we need a bigger, better lamb. Yeah, no. I mean... <laughs> In, think a an animal, in a sense, you think that animals, though, are ever really going to do it? I mean, we have to keep on doing this thing forever and forever and forever. We would need something, someone, somehow, who could do this once for all. Who could really take our place. Who could really take our place. Who could really be a penal substitutionary atonement for sin. And, and, and so with the other shadows of laws, as, as God's people look at them, they would realize there's a weakness, there's a deficiency, there's a problem. Here. Sometimes the prophets came right out and said it. But for instance, you come to the tabernacle, you can look at that and say, hmm, this is cloth, linen, woolen, ramskins, wood. It's in the middle of a desert. <laughs> it's not quite enduring. <clears throat> no, it's not terribly enduring. And there are no instructions for repairing or replacing anything either. So this thing is short term. And even when Solomon's temple came along, Solomon was quick to point out that God does not dwell in temples made with hands. Mm -hmm. And of course, eventually that temple was destroyed. They could look at the priests. The priest had one really bad habit. Well, two. The second was they sinned. The first was they died. <laughs> I think they just couldn't get over this habit of dying. Man, uh, that's the worst. Yeah. We need we need a death patch to help yep. wean the priesthood off of dying. You know, like a <laughs> nicotine patch? Uh-huh. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> I, I, I had to reach for that one. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, and I mean, this is something Paul addresses 
is this Romans? I can't believe my memory is so bad right now. But uh, that Abraham was justified before receiving circumcision. Mm -hmm. That's Romans? Yes. No. Well, it's it originally, is? it's Genesis 15. But, well, yeah, yeah, but I mean, that's the argument Paul that Paul brings it, out. Yeah, in Romans 4. So we, we ha and then God himself spoke of the circumcising of the heart. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, the circumcision of the flesh was never enough. Jeremiah spoke of a day when people will no longer talk about the Ark of the Covenant. Uh, they, they won't do that anymore, he says. Yeah, we don't even have, like, where is it, man? <laughs> In some government warehouse, apparently. Sure. Uh, the latter prophets, Isaiah, for instance, spoke of God taking Levites and priests from among the Gentiles. Malachi speaks of every place being consecrated for incense and tribute offerings. And, and we could go on with this. The, the writers of the Old Testament were in some measure conscious of the fact that the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, was deficient and that it pointed ahead and that many of these outward forms were either temporary or were not the main point in and of themselves. And if they discovered later they would be temporary, it shouldn't be a huge shock, although anytime <laughs> we make changes in the way we, th we think about God or worship God, of course, there's always that weight. Is this right? This seems strange. We've always done. We've <laughs> always done it this way, but the message was there that the old covenant is in fact insufficient. Paul and Colossians will speak of um, the shadows. The writer of Hebrews says the same thing. Stood only in meats and foods and various forms of baptism imposed upon them until the time of Reformation. So the Bible itself, from the beginning, gives ample witness that there were things about the older covenants, not just Moses' covenant, but all the way back to the garden covenant with, uh, with Adam as they were being expelled, the sacrifice of lambs, that these things were pointers on how to approach God, how to walk with God, how to draw near to God, how to be right with God, how to be holy, or rather how God would manage all of these things. And yet in the midst of all these things, there's never a suggestion, for instance, that and one day it'll be okay to go kill your neighbor if he takes you off. <laughs> one day it will be okay for you to chase your neighbor's wife and no one will be offended. One but day the she'll... new law is a law of love. <laughs> and if I love my neighbor's wife enough, does that mean... <laughs> we say that like, like the old law, if you will. Like the Ten Commandments aren't ways to love your neighbor, you know, it's drawing well, this yeah. sharp wedge between what God has revealed to be loving and a squishy feeling like of goodwill. Yeah. There, there are a couple things I think that are going on here. One is just a simple lack of thought. Uh, we, we've been programmed that when we hear the word law, we think tyranny, we think old Testament, we think, uh, contrary, a rejection of grace, mm -hmm. uh, bondage of some sort. We don't stop saying, no, wait, which of these 10 do you want to get rid of? <laughs> uh, do you want to be able to commit adultery? Do you want to be able to lie about your neighbor? Do you want to be able to kill, oh, your baby or your aging parents because they're annoying? And, and, and the response you're going to get from any Christian, even a nominal Christian one would think, is no, 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 it's not, then what is it? And I, I think the next step, and certainly this was inherent in dispensationalism originally, was it's just that it's not law. Law comes to you and says, thou shalt not, or thou shalt. It's bossing you around. We don't need that anymore. Well, there's sort of a yes and no there. If you mean mm -hmm. that the bossing around was never sufficient, Yes, that was our fault because we were sinners and we didn't want to be bossed around. Even if it was something that we wanted, we didn't want to be bossed around by it. You know, the old uh, wet paint, don't touch. Uh -huh. <laughs> Let's there's see a, if it's still wet. <laughs> there's a, yeah, there's a Far Side comic, which I haven't thought of in years. I try <laughs> to remember it. It uh, There's a sign on a wall that says, no juggling chainsaws. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and a man who cannot see it has just walked by it and says to his wife, I have never felt such an intense desire to juggle chainsaws. I wonder why. 
<laughs> well, there's the other one that I think of is, I think it's from um, Terry Pratchett, the late Sir Terry Pratchett. And he says, if you found a, a cave in the most unreachable portion of the, of the world um, under an ocean floor and you put up a sign saying end of the world button do not push ever you, you wouldn't have to wait for the paint to dry <laughs> <laughs> yeah and that's it of course our nature is so rebellious that even if someone comes and tells us to do to do something we normally would want to do we just don't like the fact we're being told to do it and so we dig in our heels and say no death first which is an interesting trick sometimes in working with teenagers. No, you don't. <laughs> yes, I do. No, you can't. I'm I'm forbidding it. Well, I'm going to do it anyway. Uh huh. Right. And yes, I am. <laughs> You've fallen right into my trap. I have heard a variation on this idea of not now in the new covenant, but in heaven there will be no law mm. because we, we'll be done with these rebellious natures, so we won't need someone bossing us. Yeah, and, and that's where we come back, I guess, and talk about God. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Someone bossing us would be God. Who and we have to ask, what, what is the law? Yeah, what, 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 is, what, what is this law thing we speak of? There's a number of ways of getting at it, but the, the, the simplest one, I suppose, for our purposes at the moment is it tells us how to love each other and how to love him. The commandments, and speaking here primarily of the ten, because those are... One of the summaries God gives us. See, there are others. Love mm -hmm. God and love your neighbor is another one. But if just to look at the 10, they are all rooted in who God is. There's mm -hmm. only one God. So why would we want to worship anyone else? God's revealed himself in Christ, who is his very image. Why would we want to make physical images? God reveals himself holy in Jesus. God's name is in him. So why would we mess around with with God's name or try to usurp God's authority, his power of attorney. Jesus is our rest. He's the faithful son of the Father. He is life. Uh, he is the true and faithful witness. He's the desire of all nations. And he is our savior. Notice the, the possession there mm -hmm. that's at the bottom of thou shalt not steal. There is this thing of, you can't take my God away from me, nor can you take me away from the God who owns me. These, these are basic ideas about who God is, or truth about reality, the reality of our divine and loving Heavenly Father. So what is it here that you don't like, and what is it here that somehow would be helpful to remove? And if trying to put what you just said in the best possible light, you're saying, well, it's so internalized you won't have to give it a second thought. Well, we're not in heaven yet, and, and we're not <laughs> told exactly how this is going to work. I don't know about second thoughts. Uh, I am pretty convinced that Christian growth continues for eternity, that since God is infinite and we're finite, we will always be learning more of God. This is not to say that our sanctification in terms of our commitment to Christ will be incomplete when we rise from the dead and see him face to face. But knowing him and understanding him better would seem to be something that goes on eternally. Mm-hmm. And if that's so, we can expect that, if not, if there's more revelation, at least the revelation will become clearer to us. So there seems to be, biblically, without, I'm not going to push too hard here, but it would be, and evidences of a contrary kind are hard to come by. And we, we all have to deal with the same finite 66 books, <laughs> uh, which don't speak a whole lot about, about eternity beyond knowing him face to face. That if what you're saying is, God will not have to tell us basic stuff anymore. All right. It is true. We will know not to steal and not to kill and not to lie. And that these things will be uh, written in our hearts, which is kind of where we're going tonight. Does that mean that God can't send us a message and say, uh, we need the black, the back 40 plowed by a week from Saturday. Can you get on that, please? Well, God would never do such a mundane thing. I don't know what God will do. I don't know what directions he's going to give. I don't know what kind of new revelation there may be. And God has decreed that today we're all going to be Englishmen and we're all going to drive on the <laughs> left side of the road. And stop whatever we're doing at four o'clock for tea. Yeah, well, the, the image of knowing God face to face is in contrast to knowing him from afar, right? It's kind of like when David and I were dating, we were 
on opposite sides of the country. Mm -hmm. So that was a very different experience from getting married and living face to face with one another, you know, and I think now being married five years, we deal with a lot more main mundane things than we did before, you know? This is the whole really living life together part. And heaven is not, or the the world to come, the new creation, whatever we should call it, is not a world of inactivity. Mm-hmm. The The judgment parables speak of having rule over many cities or reigning with Christ. There seems to be the assumption that there, there's going to be work to do, and somebody's going to be having to, you know, even if it's just, all right, today everybody drive on the right because we got stuff coming up on the left. Get out of the way, please. I, I remember a young man in college who said basically that in heaven nobody has to give orders. I said, who decides what side of the road we drive on? You know, <laughs> even if it's just new technology, new technology produces new possibilities for screwing things up. And just for efficiency's sake, there's times, well, my my friend was saying, but we we won't want to do wrong. Yeah, this is not right or wrong. This is how do we get this job done efficiently (laughs) without getting in on one another's way. Some, oh, the real topic now I remember was whether or not heaven's a democracy. And he was kind of leaning toward, well, no one's going to be telling anybody what to do. Uh, Yeah. Someone's going to be, someone's ruling the 10 cities and some people are, um, following instructions and the roles, uh, to use Lewis's image, the roles may fluctuate, fluctuate like those of a dance, where sometimes one person leads and sometimes another. But there's going to be times when we will need to know what we do next. And are we still going to be touchy and say, you can't tell me what to do? You are not the boss of me. I'm having this whole problem <laughs> with... God is king, you know, like the king and democracy don't go together. They just don't. (laughs) So like there's, there's a hierarchy, there's a chain of command, whatever you want to call it. But ultimately, no, God does not leave it up to us. (laughs) That would be dumb. Like, (laughs) And and again, it need not be that we're such evil people, but there's there there are other reasons for leadership than sin. Yes. In an unfallen world, there would still be a need for leaders, which means that there would be followers. Mm-hmm. Like a dance. I mean, there's so in the in the dance community, this is a little bit of a tangent, but I'm gonna go for it. There's a well, the swing dance community is a very urban thing, right? So it tends to be a very liberal thing. So there's a big push to stop saying ladies and gentlemen and say leads and follows when you're teaching a dance class, which is whatever. But you can't do without the idea of a lead and a follow. Mm-hmm. That function, you, you, can, you can empower the follows to dance with their own voice, and that's a great thing to do. But there's still that function. You can even switch who's doing it in the middle of a dance. That's fun, dancing switch. Yeah. But somebody's still leading. Yeah. So, backing up out of this, <laughs> Sorry. We've, no, Sorry we've gone down several tangents, <laughs> which is fine because we're kind of just clearing ground here and asking what is it about the idea of law that so upsets the average moral Christian? Most Christians are, you know, sober, hardworking, faithful to their spouses. Um, they don't lie and cheat too much on their in- income tax or steal. And yet you say law in America, in the American church, and you and people bristle. And I'm, I'm going to suggest again that first of it, first part is we just don't talk about it. And so we have learned these automatic gut reactions of law, that means bondage. And so we have to stop and say, no, what it means are um, a path of love and service and productivity. If we go around killing people, we're not going to get much done. (laughs) And if we go around killing people, we're not being governed by love. And don't try to blame this on, but I'm being led by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit doesn't go around killing people for no reason. We, We need to start thinking biblically. And sometimes that simply means we need to start reading the Bible again. Uh, Psalm 119 would be a good place to begin in this context, but so is the Sermon on the Mount. You know, when Schofield was, um, trying to introduce dispensationalism to America. He actually said the Sermon on the Mount is law 
and does not belong to the new covenant Mm -hmm. because it's telling you what to do and conditioning blessing upon it. No, that's, it's not conditioning blessing upon (laughs) it. So it's reading it, but yeah, it, it, Jesus is kind of telling us what to do. And this goes not simply for the sermon on the Mount, which was early in his ministry, goes all the way to the end when he turns to his disciples on that last night and says, if you love me, keep my commandments. So this, this is what we got here. We have God who does not abort his commandments, does not transform them, does not come up with a better set, does not leave us to our own devices, does not silence the voice of Scripture and insert his spirit in our hearts so that we are all led internally by some immediate revelation, although there are sects within the American Christian community who seem to think that, but rather he takes the moral law that God's people have always had, summarizing the Ten Commandments and the laws to love God, love our neighbor, and he begins writing them in the very center of our being by the power of the Spirit, based upon the finished work of Jesus Christ. And so this is the natural outflow, or supernatural, outflow of the gospel, that Jesus came not only to forgive sinners, but to transform us and make us productive in God's service. Uh, it's not all about what we want right now. It's about what God wants. And and the funny thing is that when we learn to do what God wants, we are happier. We are healthier. <laughs> we have a better society. We get more stuff done, and it's good stuff. And this requires an internalization of law, but it is still the law that God has revealed that is consistent mm-hmm. with his nature and that is eternal in his own character and therefore in the very heavens. It's the law that Jesus obeyed. It's the law that the Holy Spirit writes in our hearts. Now, so the it, moment we step back and say, and I can get more brownie points with God if I keep it. And... <laughs> no. That's not what it was designed for. It doesn't It cannot bear that weight. Um, so I think we need to address Galatians. Because I think there's a reading of Galatians out of context, but the spoilers, um, that says the law was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. And, and, you know, the schoolmaster, the word in Greek is the slave who would take the child to school and, like, make sure he did his homework, that sort of thing. Like, the the person who's on him to make sure he gets the stuff done. And that's the word we get uh, pedagogue from. Right. Um, the, King, the King James says schoolmaster, but it's not that. It's not a right. teacher. It's not the teacher. It's the the person cracking the proverbial whip. <laughs> um, the piano teacher who says, this is what you are practicing this week. Um, no, it's actually more like mom. Right, more like mom. Getting you up in the morning right. throwing cold water at you if necessary <laughs> and standing there with a stick. Yeah. The piano teacher becomes the good guy. In this context. Right. It's mom. That's scary. Exactly. Oh, I wish I had been more like that when my girls were little. Um <laughs> I mean, you're going to pay for it. Well, actually, we didn't. The lessons were given us, and we did not do with them all that we should have. Because, you know, sin in all of us. It's easier to stay in I used to I used to pray that Jesus would return before my next <laughs> piano lesson. <laughs> <laughs> you never went that far. Um, so you want to talk about that. All right. Well, let me read just a little bit from there. We are told... The Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it's written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. The background for all of that is, how do you get blessing? And Paul talks about two types of blessing that are interrelated, and that's kind of his point. They're interrelated. One is being righteous before God, justification by faith. The other is having the gift of the Holy Spirit, to empower you to live a godly life. And these are not two separate things, Paul argues. The the Galatian heretics, Judaizers, were trying to make them two phases in the Christian life. Mm -hmm. You come to Christ by faith, and you're justified, and if you die, you'd go to heaven. But if you really want power for living, for being really spiritual, higher life, deeper life, more victorious life, then you need to do something, and in their case, a specific thing was circumcision, and then the other elements of the, the ceremonial law. And Paul is arguing, no, Jesus died for us. And that opens up both justification and sanctification, forgiveness of sins and the gift of the Spirit. And this is received, that you might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. And he goes on and says, <clears throat> even in a, in a human co- covenant, once you've made a covenant or a contract, you can't change the terms, at least unilaterally. You, can't, you, you could both agree to go back and 
change them. But one person can't go back and say, oh, by the way, I inserted retroactively this new stipulation. I have altered the deal. Pray I've I altered. alter it further. Yeah. <laughs> and um, you, you, you cannot do that. And, and God, of course, is does not do that. He doesn't go back on his word. And since the promise was made to Abraham and to his seed, which seed is Christ, the law, he argues, the covenant that was confirmed before of God and Christ, the law which was 430 years, cannot descend all of the nation make the promise of that effect. For if the inheritance be of the law, it's no more promise, but God gave it to Abraham by promise. So whatever, the law given by Moses, with all the things that wrapped around it, the Levitical priesthood and the tabernacle and the feasts and the fast and everything else, all of that came 430 years after the promise to Abraham. Whatever its intention, it could not be something that God ever intended to alter the basic condition of righteousness by faith alone and of the spirit by faith alone, because those were the blessings to Abraham. Well, the, con the question then is, well, then why in the world do we need the law? Wherefore then serveth the law? It was added because of transgressions till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. Now, Paul does not say this is the only reason, but it's the one that's adapted to what he's facing. He's facing people who are saying, well, it was added so that you could get more blessings. You know, sure, God, God brought you into covenant, but if you really want to be blessed in that covenant, then here's the list of things you get to do to earn your super brownie points with God. And Paul is saying, look, whatever it was, it was not that. In fact, exactly the opposite, because when we look into the law of God and look see ourselves in it, we see we're sinners. There, there's no blessing that way. There's nothing to add to. We don't, we don't have anything we can add to what Jesus has done. So what, what does the law do? Is it was added because of transgressions. And he goes on, is the law then against the promises of God? For God forbid. For if there had been a law which could have given life, then righteousness should have been by the law. If it were that easy, God would have said, here's a list of commandments. Keep them and I'll glitch into heaven. It, it, it can't do that. You cannot earn God's favor in any degree, in any fashion, to any end, not for justification, not for sanctification. But the scripture hath concluded all under sin that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. And here's the passage you were talking about. But before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up under the faith, which should afterwards be revealed. Wherefore, the law was our schoolmaster, to bring us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. All right, so the first part then is, is fairly easy. And notice the we. He's talking about the covenant people. He's talking about Israel. Before, Because the externals of the whole Mosaic law did not apply to the world. There were some things that specifically did not apply to Gentiles, like the dietary law. But what, what was the purpose of all of that? If it wasn't to earn God's blessing, what was to do? What was it to do? Well, one thing it was to do, and in, in, in Paul's mind, the most important thing at this point in their discussion, is that it was to shut them up to the faith that was to be revealed. In other words, it held them together under conviction and pointed them down the road of their uh, historical development toward Messiah, toward what he would do. They, God needed his people kept together, centered in the promise, centered around the divine revelation, centered in the worship of God. And they had to stay with that until Messiah would come, at which point they would understand more fully exactly what God was about and what, what this, this gospel was. Although he had said it, he would say it much more clearly once it was accomplished. To bring us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. And now the, the lines you were talking about. But after faith has come, we're no longer under a schoolmaster, for you are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. And he goes on and talks about what it, some of what that means. Um, the externals, insofar as they were there to drive us to Christ, no longer have that function with us. And so those things wherein that was the primary or maybe the only function, those things are gone. We don't need sacrifices. We don't need priests. We don't need a tabernacle. We don't need a temple. We don't need circumcision. Those things. We don't. And and, and on, on another level, we don't even need the. Once we've come to Christ, we don't need the threats of the law. Yes, the law says do this and live. Oh, you didn't. Well, you're going to die now. The soul that sinneth that must die. We don't need that because we've come to Christ and we found our salvation, our life in Him. So in all of those ways. 
we are free from the law. Mm-hmm. We're, we're free from its ceremonies. We're free from its curse and its threats. We're free from trying to grab onto it and use it as a tool to justify or sanctify ourselves. Um, there, there are ways in which it was indeed like that slave who would take the recalcitrant child across town at six in the morning to see his teacher and stand there and make sure he got his paid attention to his lessons. But you know, there comes a time when the kid grows up, the lessons are internalized, and that slave, and I wrote an article about this a while back for my friend Bill Hyde, um, that slave might often become a friend and advisor of the child Mm -hmm. in his later years. That becomes a joyful friendship, huh? So like in in our piano analogy, you stop having to have mom crack the whip and you start to actually enjoy playing piano. You don't stop playing piano. Right. But it's become a joy to you, and it's something that you do because you want to. But it's the same thing that you're, you've are you learned. <laughs> yeah, and it doesn't mean that mom or your teacher may not say, hey, why don't you try this? Mm-hmm. And now that you've begun to master things, you say, oh, you mean like this? Not death first. Don't tell me what to do. <laughs> yeah. um, so I, I hope that that's not a, a completely thorough exegesis of the passage, but I think that's enough to set us on our way and say, yes, there are things that the New Testament warns us about with regard to the law, like some things are gone. We already admitted that and talked about that the shadows and ceremonies that had no purpose beyond that, they're gone. The the fear that we are going to go to hell because, well, the law keeps telling us that that's what happens to people who break it. Well, that's gone. The desire, the temptation, or the fear that we have to keep the law to earn God's blessing, whether it be the blessing of justification or the gift of the Spirit, sanctification, that's gone. Uh, We are also free from the taboos of men who would say, well, you're that kind of Christian, you really do that? You really drink that? You really wear that? You really have one of those? You really Mm -hmm. read that stuff? You really watch that? Oh, you're that kind of Christian? You know, we're, we're free from that because we have in Scripture a clear revelation of God's will uh, and that is constantly being internalized for us. Uh, And and so rather than being the voice outside that says, here's the way, walk you in it, it's the voice in the heart, which is put there by the Spirit, through the Word of God, through the written (laughs) Word of God, preached, taught, read. Not in contrary to it. Nothing contrary to it that says this is indeed the way. I recognize it. It has my Savior's footprints all over it. Um, but when we when we think of the law given in in the Old Testament, we're thinking of God's own character mm-hmm. put forward to Israel, even in the New Testament, where many of the ceremonial laws are fulfilled in Christ. We still have in the law. God's character portrayed to us, just as it mm-hmm. was to Israel as a nation. Mm-hmm. And the law still has a clear benefit for us. We don't, we don't get to escape God's moral requirements. Mm-hmm. Even if, you know, th- the people who, who butt up against the, the idea of law in the Christian life, they say, it, oh, we're, it's, it's just going to be so internalized. It's still there. <laughs> yeah. It's still in your spirit. It's still being enforced in some sense by what the Holy Spirit has done in your life through sanctification. You are the still The content growing. of it hasn't changed. The substance of it hasn't changed. Exactly. You're still uh, growing in the love of God and the love of neighbor. And even when we we get to heaven to the eschaton we're still going to we're gonna we're gonna have that impulse perfected and Mm -hmm. it's still going to be the same substance because we're still we're not going to do any of the things that the law prohibits right and and we're going to do that perfectly we're in fact we are not going to be able to breach the law (laughs) uh because we're being brought to the the status that that christ has but yes, the law is, it is good. I mean, the Psalms talk about the law so much. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's never in the sense of, oh, this is, 
This is so burdensome. Um, <laughs> trying to keep the law for your salvation is burdensome. Yeah, absolutely. But uh, like, like the Heidelberg, I, I couldn't quote a specific thing that I'm thinking of from the Heidelberg, but the Heidelberg as a thing that is built <laughs> out, the structure of it is the third section is gratitude. Mm -hmm. And that's where the law comes in for the Christian. We live out the law now in our lives as a reflection of God's character, as a reflection of being made in Christ, uh, being further built into Christ's image, and as true moral character and, 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 and living. I, I think I'm pin, ping-ponging across <laughs> multiple different sides of a dodecahedron here, but um, <laughs> essentially what I'm getting at uh, as well is that just because you don't know the law by hearing it from Scripture doesn't mean that you're not... In, it's not incumbent on you to follow it because mm. uh, a concept I've leaned a bit more heavily into in my own personal theology, I guess, is that if God made the world, it's going to reflect him. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that means that living the way God wants you to live is going to be, generally speaking, the best way for you to live in the yes. world. Absolutely. It's going to be more, maybe not more personally advantageous to you in, in, a, in a rough Machiavellian kind of sense, <laughs> but it's going to be you know, living honestly, dealing honestly with your fellow men, not murdering everyone you meet, um, respecting the bonds of marriage, and not sleeping around. Those are all going to have very practical benefits for you. <laughs> yes. Um, now and, and in the long run and in eternity. I mean, yeah, yeah occasionally it's the... Don't bow down, or, or here's a fiery furnace. But generally, yeah. the, the, generally the the advantages appear very soon, and when they don't, they do appear. Yes. It is better to serve God and to love God than not in God's yes. world. Strangely enough. So yeah, it, and and when you look at people who who are not believers, who have never heard of the gospel, and they still have recognized some of these practicalities. Mm -hmm. That is a result of them living in God's world and observing how things work without suppressing it. It doesn't happen all the way. You don't get to the fullness of this kind of beauty of God's law without hearing it from God. But you can see it. You can see glimpses yeah. of it around the world because they're looking at the world God made. Mm -hmm. And the uh, I, I, I kind of comes back to honesty, which is <laughs> something that God would perhaps unknowingly to them give them. But if they're honest about what they see in the world, no. they align with this uh, in one of the epistles. I think it might even be in Galatians. I, I am terrible when it comes to referencing epistles. I just know what things and <laughs> sections of verses of, of, of scripture says i can't it's even better than a lot of people <sighs> yeah but still i feel bad about <laughs> it sometimes it says when those who are not under the law do the things that the law requires it is good funny you should mention that <laughs> because that's kind of where we were going with all this and we're almost out of time so <laughs> yeah. rather than try to cram it into five minutes we're going to come back next time and talk about this very thing that Brian's been talking about. When you live in God's world and you are God's creature, some familiarity with God's law is impo is necessary, is required. It's, it's mm -hmm. going to happen. The question is, how clear is it going to be? Mm -hmm. How far, how clear is it? How much do we receive it, uh, even though it may be clear? Uh, how does sin get in the way of that? And then why do we need the new covenant, Brian? set off camera. It goes with the new year. Yes. So we'll start the new year with, <laughs> why do we need this new covenant thing anyway? Don't we have the revelation of God all around us and within us? Don't we have a pretty fair idea? Are we mostly honest about what God has said? Stay tuned. And we'll talk to you next time. <laughs> but before we go, let's make some recommendations of stuff that we've read or watched or enjoyed. Um, so my wife and I started watching a TV show that I, I had seen when it was coming out and she has watched a couple times through before. 
Uh, but I hadn't seen any of it in years. Uh, the show is Psych. Oh, uh, you recommended this already. I did, but I we finished the series today, like two but hours. But you still before already we recommended recording. it. It doesn't oh, matter. I'm going to do it again. That's how good the show is. <laughs> yeah, you've um, done that too. So, yeah. and and specifically, I'm going to highlight. It's not it's not unique to Psych, but it's um it's a storytelling aspect that I am generally just fascinated by, uh, even even in stories that are dominated by sinful secular thought, uh, uh, especially regarding like sex and sexual mores. Um, most stories recognize that marriage is the end goal. Marriage, mm-hmm. marriage is a natural conclusion yeah. to a person's growth and development as a character. Mm-hmm. At least in the term in, in terms of story. Obviously, I'm married. I've been married just over a year. You guys have been married longer than me. And uh you guys are still growing as people uh, mm-hmm. in marriage. In fact, it's one of the best one of the best ways to grow uh in sanctification. But there's something very beautiful about that fact. Spoilers for the show that ended, you know, eight years ago. But um <laughs> at the end. Sean moves to San Francisco where his girlfriend has moved to. And in the last three minutes of the show, he proposes to her and it's very wonderful. It, it's super emotional. If you've been watching mm-hmm. it straight, like we have been. And I, I keep thinking about, about this concept every once in a while is that when that romantic arc is consummated, it is an echo of what history is going towards. It's the, mm-hmm. it's the consummation. It's the wedding feast of the lamb. We're going to have a big wedding party between the church and Christ <laughs> at the end of history. And stories as a reflection of the story of salvation can't help get it. They can't get away from that. Uh, even if they, mm-hmm. they think they're being clever or just like leaning into a, uh, um, a trope they they recognize this is a natural end point mm-hmm. for a story a particular kind of story and, it's and the fans so would be disappointed if that last three minute thing weren't in there they would be because it would feel it would feel incomplete and yeah. open-ended and uh mm-hmm. hollow um yeah. so anyway yes I'm, rec- I'm recommending psych a second time but more specifically i'm also just geeking out over the fact that that appears across so many stories, regardless of the writers, the um, producers, faith status, they they <laughs> still can't get away from it. I think I will make a recommendation next. And okay. it, that is actually the perfect segue, like our recommendations dovetail here. The book that I would like to recommend is called The Nine Brides and Granny Height. It's a collection of great. short stories. It's extremely, oh, what's the word? The, the, the thing where it's it's just like itself and there's nothing else quite like it. That's, that's Esa, what this esoteric? book is. No, esoteric means. Secret knowledge. It's not yeah. secret knowledge. It's, it's extremely enjoyable. Um, but this is the book that uh, we read some of the stories from for my birthday party um, earlier this year. Um, we we read a few stories, and then our mutual friend David Farshman was like, "Well, this this book, I need to buy this book." And so he went on Amazon right then and there and bought the book. And then a few months later, he says, "Emily, I know what I want to do for my birthday. I want to read this book." So <laughs> so we got together for his birthday and read some more of the book. Um, and the the premises. The the um there's this town called Cat Track Hollow in Appalachia, where some sometime between World War One and World War Two, very remote, mountaintop people, trapping, a little bit of farming, but really, really rural, shall we say? And the the story overarching is that there's a quilting bee for all the the brides who are waiting for the circuit riding preacher to come and marry them. <laughs> and so as they're making each quilt for each of these nine brides, they each have to tell the story of how they got engaged. Um, and it's 
wonderful. It's very down to earth, as you would expect from the setting. And it's just delightful stories. And you get that sense again and again of the beauty of marriage, even among, you know, very sinful people, you know, not there's no perfect engagement story, right? Everybody's got their <laughs> their thing of like, oh, I was such an idiot or, you know, because we're all sinners. And when we get married on this earth, it's two sinners getting married. Um, yeah. And then when we look at the, the cosmic love story, it's, wow, we were really sinful and Jesus still loves us. Wow. Um, and it's really great to just reflect on that and enjoy all of the the sub-created reflections of it. So I'm going to go ahead and recommend that. Um, I think that's going to go for Greg's recommendation as well as he insisted that I recommend it today. Awesome. Um, um, which works because he actually had to run off um, and see to some things. So we will leave it there. Um, Greg and I will share that recommendation with you and we will say good night. So thank you so much, Brian, for being here. Thanks to Greg also. And thanks to David, our producer, and my lawfully wedded husband. Thanks to you, our listeners. We appreciate you tuning in. Thanks to our financial supporters. We appreciate you keeping the show rolling. And thank you very much for my new microphone. It helps the editing a lot. And we'll see you next week. Oh, by the way, you can email us at haltingtowardszion at gmail.com. Thanks. Bye. Bye.